Hello, I'm Tansy Thomas uh, at the Davis Community Television Channel 5. I'm pleased to introduce you to my guests, Associate Professor of Sociology, Carl Jorgensen, and the, uh, the, associate, the Assistant Professor of, um, of American Studies, Nicole Fleetwood and the Assistant Professor of Sociology, Bruce Haynes, all from UC Davis. Uh, welcome. Uh, this discussion is America Beyond the Color Line by Henry Louis Gates, a public broadcasting documentary aired recently in the Sacramento area. And I will uh, start off, begin by asking my guests to make a initial statement about their reaction or, or any feelings they uh, want to share with us about the documentary? Well, uh, let me start by describing it. Uh, Henry Louis Gates said that he was going to interview black people the way they talk to other black people in order to expose that to the country as a whole. And there were four segments to the series. One was basically upper middle class people in the South. Another was very successful black people in the North. Mm -hmm. A third was about the black poor in Chicago. And a fourth mm -hmm. was about black Hollywood. And right. I, I think he does a very good job of engaging these people in conversation, uh, casual conversation of the type that you would hear as a, as a black person. I think in that sense, it's very successful. I, I think it's very interesting in exposing us to pe to black, how much more successful black people are now, or some black people are now, than they were 10 or 15 years ago. The types of houses they have, the types of positions they have, you know, black man head of Fannie Mae, one of the biggest corporations in the country, et cetera, et cetera, Hollywood stars. Um, I think that the film is limited in a couple of senses. The, the first way in which the film is limited is that it really talks to upper middle class and lower upper class, uh, and it talks to the poor. But he doesn't talk to working class people or middle class people. He doesn't talk to janitors or uh, high school teachers or social workers, etc. So we get a look at sort of both ends of the spectrum of black America, but not much in the middle. Um, and the, the second thing I think he does is uh, some of the people have, they're telling their view of the situation, but their view of the situation is not necessarily an accurate view. So it's useful to know their view, but we can't really take it necessarily as reality. Um, and so there's a problematic there. So I'm really very pleased with the series, but I also thought there were some real limitations to it. Uh, before I start with uh, Professor Fleetwood, uh, it dawned on me that I didn't give some information that would be helpful to the public. So let me go back and uh, talk to you uh, a little from the press release issued by public broadcasting system. And it says, 100 years ago, the celebrated African-American intellectual, W.E.B. Du Bois, fam uh, famously identified the problem of the 20th century as, quote, the problem of the color line, unquote. America has come a long way since Du Bois made his prophecy. And the politics of race have undergone dramatic change. So what, a century later? are the new challenges faced by um, African Americans. For Gates, this is both the best and the worst of times. Black Americans are center stage in almost every arena, and opportunities have opened up that just three decades ago seemed unimaginable. But huge obstacles remain. Many African Americans say they still feel excluded from mainstream American life. And a fifth of all black Americans currently live below the poverty line. In four programs, Gates travels to four different parts of America, the East Coast, the Deep South, and uh, inner city Chicago, and Hollywood, 
He explores this rich and diverse landscape, social as well as geographic, and meets the people who are defining black America from the most famous and influential Colin Powell, Quincy Jones, Samuel L. Jackson, Fannie Mae's Franklin Raines, Jesse Jackson, Russell Simmons, Chris Tucker, Alicia Keys, Maya Angelou, Morgan Freeman, to those at the grassroots. Now, I will ask you uh, to make your, uh, any statement or comments. Uh, this is Professor Nicole Fleetwood. Well, I agree with um, Carl that, you know, the documentary is ambitious and it's really important. I like how Gates frames it as a journey, his kind of personal journey through four various regions and different socioeconomic groups. Um, I was disappointed in his, how male-centered the series is. Um, he rarely interviews um, black women, and when he does, I feel like he ghettoizes their issues and often um, leaves the women to discuss gender issues as if gender issues mm -hmm. don't impact men. Um, I also was um, a little um, troubled by how he portrayed the South um, as um, this, um, you know, kind of folkloric place in the past that is still framed by like um, Jim Crow, you know, kind of oppression, and he doesn't understand why black successful people would ever venture into that area. And he seemed to actually kind of pathologize blacks for moving back to the South. Um, I also had trouble with how he talked about black um, poor in Chicago and his um, call to the upper class blacks to kind of solve um, black poor problems or to teach the black poor how to um, integrate into American liberal democracy. Um, these are issues that I'd like to discuss amongst the group, but I want to, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead and pass it on to right. uh, Dr. Professor, Haynes. Professor uh, mm -hmm. Bruce Haynes. Well, I agree with everything that's been <laughs> said so far. Um, I'd like to focus, I guess, on on two aspects. One is the notion that, the, that Carl brought up that the views that were presented, although very informative, uh, um, insightful in the sense we get to see um, really how people like Colin Powell think about race and, and racial issues. Um, they're not social scientists and don't necessarily know what the trends are happening within mm -hmm. black America. Um, and so some of the things I wanted to address, um, uh, Nicole just touched on sort of the, the idyllic South that, mm -hmm. that Skip Gates presents. He also kind of reproduces what I'd call a kind of idealistic vision of the civil rights movement that revolves around Martin Luther King um, and without giving, and I guess what I say at the expense, I should say, of uh, focus on other folks uh, such as Bayard Rustin mm -hmm. or other individuals who are uh, instrumental in, in the movement. Um, he also alludes to the fact that um, two distinct classes are emerging within black America. Uh, one who is making it, one who is lagging behind in places like the Chicago projects that he made reference to. Uh, but this is not a new phenomenon. Um, scholars have talked about this uh, since William Julius Wilson's book, book uh, Declining Significance of Race, published in 1978. Um, and that gap has been increasing across the nation, not just with black Americans, but with uh, Americans in general. And so I think we have to understand this widening wealth gap within a broader American context. Um, by the same token, we have to understand the movement or the return to the South, which has been occurring since 1970s. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, but the new census data uh, suggests that African Americans are increasingly suburbanizing. But we don't really know where they're suburbanizing from. So we don't really know, is this a, a increased return from northerners to southern suburbs, or is this other southerners suburbanizing uh, uh, from other regions of the south? Um, so there's a lot of, um, uh, you, you could come away from the series with a lot of misconceptions about the state of black America. Uh, how are some of those misconceptions? Um, the black middle class family, 
uh, the average black middle class family is dependent upon two wage earners. Uh, they're not living in McMansions on large estates returning yeah. to Atlanta, uh, <laughs> for example. Right. Um, so some of the people, though very successful, though certainly suggestive mm -hmm. of institutional, uh, um, uh, an institutional opening since mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Movement, yeah. uh, that doesn't really speak to the state of the average middle class black American. And with that, I guess I would I'd love to, yeah, right. to I turn it over for discussion. Open discussion. I Go for it. I thought another misconception also was that um, blacks um, in general blame other blacks for their conditions. Yes. Because often Gates frames his um, questions, like for example, I can think of um, his questions to actors in Hollywood. Is this an issue of race or an issue of talent? Exactly. over and over again, mm -hmm. or his uh, questions to residents of housing projects in Chicago uh -huh. um, that are very loaded. Basically, what, what are the troubles in your neighborhood? Well, they live in an all-black community of other poor people, so of course they're going to talk about what happens within those confines. Exactly. No, I, I completely agree with you. I, I, I found that section that segment the most disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Gates presents uh, the right saying they say it's all about culture and behavior mm -hmm. and values. Uh, the left says it's all about structure and conditions and he presents himself as uh, going to shed light on these two the sort of intractable debate and we're going to talk to the tenants themselves to, to really understand what's going on. But the tenants themselves can only talk about what they know, which is the, the deteriorating conditions in the community, the uh, deteriorating conditions of their neighbors, uh, the drug use of their neighbors, the, the delinquency of their neighbors. And so we walk away with a feeling of individual dysfunction mm -hmm. rather than understanding um, how did that housing project get there in the first place? Why is that housing project predominantly black in the first place? What happened to city services when that housing project got built? What happened to the public schools in that neighborhood? What are the other social conditions that maybe lead to some of these uh, social pathologies that we are often talking about? Yeah, I'd like to talk maybe for a few minutes about some things. One is uh, about Davis and Afro-American studies. Uh, started really 1968 through 1968 to about 1978 or so, uh, everyone, other people heavily involved in Afro-American studies was so stressful that a lot of people got sick. Mm -hmm. Five people, and some of you will remember them, died before they were 60. Jackie Mitchell, uh, Paul Hardy, uh, James King, Maybe not Chuck not Irby, Ed Turner. No, they died before they were 60. That's a true fact. And, and that's five out of about 12 people. And the other people who were heavily involved with it, myself, Carl Mack, Al McNeil, got sick to the point of needing medical attention. Then the university started, decided to uh, put six FTE in each program. I mean, at that time, Afro-American Studies only had two faculty members or two and a half faculty members. When that happened, all of a sudden, people weren't getting sick anymore. Now, you could look at the people who died at a young age and point to things that they did that they shouldn't have done. But the fact is, you change the structure, and all of a sudden you have this change. And also, uh, the faculty of color who came here between 1970 and 1977, to the best of my knowledge, only one or two ever became full professors. But after the culture change, everyone you know, people making normal progress. And so you could look at those people who didn't become full professors and talk about, well, what is their pathology? You know, what is it that they could have done differently? You can always look at someone and say, how could they have done better? But sometimes, you know, it's it, the this, this structure, you change conditions and people are able to succeed where they weren't before. I mean, for example, now we've had this great increase in the number of women going to college. I mean, when I went to Harvard, uh, a quarter, 
the Radcliffe students were a quarter of the male student body. Now uh, the female students are 55 to 58 percent of the college students, and everyone's wondering what's happened to the males? Why have they fallen behind? I mean, that's just an example of how much social structure can change things in ways where we can't figure out why it happened, but we can see that it happened. And I think that this is in part um, what's missing here. I mean, you have all of these, you know, I, I'm keeping track of the police stuff. You know, we just had a policeman in New York City shoot a guy unarmed walking around on the rooftops in New York. We just had the police in South Carolina do these drug arrests, and the school was 80% white, and they came in at such a time where there were mostly black people there, and they harassed the black people. And we just mm -hmm. don't know what the well, effect of all we'll of call, that if, is. If I can follow up on that, I mean, part of, I think, what you're alluding to is that there, there, is the glass full or the glass half empty in looking mm -hmm. at middle class black mm -hmm. Americans? Yes. On the one hand, if mm -hmm. we look at the post-1965 era, we can see great institutional change. Right. We have Colin Powell. Mm -hmm. We have Condoleezza Rice. We have, um, and of course, some of these folks are conservative, <laughs> and, and whether or not they, they support the issues as the black community defines them is a different issue. But the fact that they are people of African descent who've made it into these positions of power, mm -hmm. that in and of itself mm -hmm. symbolizes major structural change in America. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, we have a massive, we, we have plenty of evidence to suggest that the black middle class, for instance, lags behind in wealth compared to people of equal status in the white community, equal education, equal op uh, uh, occupations. Um, there's evidence that uh, that middle class is less able to pass their wealth on to their children. Mm -hmm. That is a concern. Mm -hmm. There is an education gap occurring right now in college attendance for uh, um, African American men and women. Women are going on to college. Men seem to be lagging. Um, that will create a crisis down the road for young African American women who tend not to marry out of the race. Who will they be marrying? So, so there are issues that are that are of critical concern to this expanding black middle class that if you walked away from the segment, mm -hmm. you would have thought you just need to get a, a job like yeah. like uh, mm -hmm. one of the Chris's and, and you would be okay. But uh, don't you find that some of these trends also encourage, uh, occurring in other populations? Uh, like I understand that it's a, uh, uh, the white populations begin to show that sort of uh, trend. Some trends, but some trends are distinctly racial in terms of, the, for instance, the educational gap is a distinctly racial uh, effect. The, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the wealth gap is a distinctly mm -hmm. racial yes. effect. That mm -hmm. affects the ability of middle class parents to send their children to places like UC Davis. For instance, if they live in a community where their house mm -hmm. is devalued, mm -hmm. therefore they cannot take out as much money on their second sure. mortgage, therefore they have less capital to on other things. Mm -hmm. So there is a cumulative impact mm -hmm. um, that we see when we're just looking at black and white classes. Well, and, and also that's a major real quality issue. of life issues such, such as a lot of lower middle class blacks don't have health insurance. Uh -huh. You know, and issues of that did not come. I think those are oh, really yeah, important I kind of structural is issues. Structural, uh -huh. uh, I see that as I, I think in terms of the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. uh, that sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, who are the gatekeepers and, and, uh, and their impact on who gets in and under what circumstances, that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, that's how uh, I look at it. And um, do you, so far as the black middle class that's described by Henry Louis Gates in his documentary, uh, what, what did you uh, make of them? Did you think it was all right for them to be comfortable in their black suburbs? Well, what was interesting, I think, as Carl pointed out, many of the people that we saw, most people would not think of them as middle class. People mm -hmm. who earn a million dollars a year, people who earn five million dollars a film, uh, people who mm -hmm. buy a hundred acres of land in upscale communities at a time. Yeah. 
these are not your typical middle class African Americans. Your typical middle class African American works for the state or city government, um, or they work in a corporate uh, uh, segment in, in personnel or human resources, or in some segment of affirmative action. Um, that's more typical of your average middle class African American. Um, so what we didn't really see middle class African Americans. Mm -hmm. What we saw were pretty upper class African Americans and, and people who were still stuck in housing projects. Mm -hmm. And those were sort of two extremes of black America. Mm -hmm. um, you rarely see folks like us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're middle class black America. In the sense, mm -hmm. we, you rarely see us on TV. <laughs> um, uh, you know, folks who, who are middle managers at, at the local drugstore. Folks who are, you know, managers on floors at department stores. Mm -hmm. no, These are your middle class folks. You're talking about the media blackout? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, civil servants, uh, uh, social workers, teachers, policemen, firemen. Yeah, but that's a great point. I mean, the documentary, in fact, fits in with kind of the ways in which non-narrative television frames black America as incredibly successful and hyper-visible, a la the athlete, mm -hmm. the Hollywood star, mm -hmm. exactly. or extremely poor, degenerate, and... Culturally dysfunctional. Exactly. So well, you, the kind of, the majority of black Americans missing, are yeah. missing, missing from the documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. And uh, I thought, one of the things, when you asked me what I thought was striking about the documentary, uh, one of the things was uh, they said one fifth of, of Black Americans live in poverty, this and I true. says I think the media image is that it's the other way around. <laughs> uh, 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 I think that's one of the reasons why in Davis yes. um, there's a tendency to think that everybody's on welfare, even though you're professors, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you're here to burglarize some, something, and or, or your children uh, uh, are just seen as inner city children needy and, and, and kind of scary. Well, dur during the Reagan era, there was uh, a lot of public debate, particularly coming from the right, that associated welfare with urban blacks, particularly mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I mean, that, that stereotype has existed historically, yeah. uh, but it really got solidified in the 90s during the Reagan era. Uh, and there's a good book by a scholar named Marty Gill Gillens. At, I think he's mm -hmm. at UCLA now, mm -hmm. uh, about the images mm -hmm. of welfare women oh. on the media. Yeah, it, it's a scandalous. I remember I became enraged during the Reagan era, in which a report, I, had, I was working at the, uh, was I at the Attorney General's office? I think I was. Well, I had seen this report put out by the Department of Social Services, in which it gave uh, the profile of the average welfare recipient in California at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was a white married mm -hmm. woman and a legitimate yeah. white child was mm -hmm. the average welfare recipient. Well, I couldn't believe it, but a month later, the Republican caucus had this, um, uh, mm -hmm. I guess it was a white paper. Mm -hmm. It was saying, that, like, stop welfare. And they had a pregnant black woman on the mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. And, and so I called in to San Francisco mm -hmm. Station. And, and I said, uh, that's racist. And of course, they scoffed at me. It was uh, mm -hmm. KGO. Mm -hmm. And they scoffed at me. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I've seen the report. It was signed by Ronald Reagan. And mm -hmm. he gave the profile. Mm -hmm. So to humor me, he called mm -hmm. and checked that uh, uh, mm -hmm. apologetically mm -hmm. to the state office. Oh. And said, this woman says, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And the woman says, she's right. <laughs> and he's, what? <laughs> and the, the debate was going on about, you remember, yeah. I don't know if you remember the debate about taking away uh, illegitimate children yes. from, uh, mm -hmm. from welfare yes. recipients. Mm -hmm. Then he says, well, then what is this debate about? And there wasn't another <laughs> call came in after I called. So, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, your, your reaction to his report about uh, women uh, going to, now the numbers are greater for women going to college. Did you have anything to add to his comment about the, uh, do you see that as a pr problem and how do you see it and what do you see as uh, any kind of s s 
should there, is there a solution or something we're supposed to do or just something we, are, we observe about that? Well, I mean, I think that still college enrollment for black males and females is disproportionately low. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I mean, we should look at that as a minor success that we see black women in college, but the numbers are still quite low, especially mm -hmm. compared to um, white entering and also Asian Americans entering and increasingly even Latino students entering. Um, you know, we need, when we talk about kind of black, the lack of um, male, black males on campus, we also have to talk about issues of public education and um, the criminal justice system and what's happening, what type of training is happening to young black males. We can't oh. separate those issues, I think. Uh -huh. I just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. one thing. Uh, we don't know exactly who's going to college. We mm -hmm. simply know there's a, a aggregate gap. So in other words, we don't know if it's the working class or poor mm -hmm. or middle mm -hmm. class kids who are actually attending. We just know that there's a gap in the attendant, overall attendance rate. Mm -hmm. So later we will know more when they And then there's also the, the issue data. of staying in, in school because blacks, black college dropout rate is quite high compared to whites and Asian Americans. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but we do know this about mm -hmm. college attendance. We do know that colleges are increasingly getting costly even public education. Mm -hmm. And we do know that increasingly middle class parents are taking out second mortgages to finance their college mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. So all things being equal, we could expect a disproportionate impact on middle class mm -hmm. black families to finance their mm -hmm. children. Who are not mm -hmm. eligible for financial aid. Right, also, right? exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I have a perspective mm -hmm. on this. I would expect that. A at mm -hmm. Davis, I looked at one of the classes, I think 2001, and the ratio of male to female across ethnicity. And blacks were about in the middle. I mean, I mean it's, a little, no, it's a little higher than average, but it's not that much higher. And there are other groups, I can't name them right now, I didn't r bring this with me, where the rates are higher. So what we're seeing is sort of a general phenomenon that's being represented as a black phenomenon and then pathologized. It's mm -hmm. sort of like the general welfare phenomenon. You represent it as a black phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You pathologize it. Mm -hmm. Then you say, oh, these people, it's character. They could do better. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, in fact, what's happening, uh, I talked about this in my interracial and interpersonal dynamics class, is that a lot of the young women in the class, I mean, the whites too, they're more white females than white males here. You know, they were thinking about you know, I have to be ready to marry someone who's not as education, educated as I am. And if I can find someone that's good, that's okay. But they're sort of dealing with their parents who want them to marry, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or something. And they're saying that, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, if those are going to be disproportionately women. That's maybe not going to happen. And so... Uh, this isn't uh, a specifically black problem. It may be a little more acute in the black community, but it, it's, it's a general issue. I'm not even sure I want to call it a problem, but uh, you know, it, it, it's a trend that's going on. Now, I want to uh, uh, say something else about this pathologizing. You know, Carol Stack, um, a friend of mine who was at Berkeley and is now retired, when she did All My Kin, uh, well, she's white. She was studying a black working class and poor community outside of Chicago. And she said, decided that she, as a graduate student at the time, would try to help people negotiate with uh, the city agencies. And she said at the end, I couldn't negotiate with those city agencies any better than the people did unless I pulled out my status card. You know, unless I pulled out that I was a graduate student, yes. blah, 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 then I would get, then things would get done. And there was a book by Charles Valentine and his wife, whose name I don't remember, which came to, to the same conclusion, that it wasn't a question that, that these people didn't know how to negotiate mm -hmm. with these systems and needed more education. It was that, you know, there was yes. a bias so there that couldn't be broken through. So unless you had status, and I'm kind right. of re reminded of when my mother was sick and needed to go back in the hospital, and my sister was there and I was there, 
And the people there were saying, we can't put her back into the hospital until we get a doctor to say she has to go in the hospital, blah, blah, blah. And then my sister said, uh, my sister's married to an orthopedist, and she said, this is uh, Dr. Morgan's, you know, mother-in-law, and he would, you know, greatly appreciate it if you took care of her. Well, I mean, yes, it was done in like that's 20 not seconds. That's not surprising. You know, so, uh, so, you know, there's this way of, um, of, how to of pathologizing the people. Yeah, that, that's when, a part of it. Uh, uh, but I think there yeah. is a major educational issue that is definitely missing from the documentary and that is, is that we do need to discuss. And, um, the, you know, the recent book, Bad Boys, I can't think of the author, the name of the author, who did an ethnographic study oh, of yes. public schools? Ferguson. In a, and yeah, mm -hmm. Ferguson. Yeah. And looking at how um, disproportionately the, punished black male mm -hmm. students are, and also mm -hmm. I before going to graduate yeah. school, I was a public school teacher. Yeah. And in especially most urban areas, yeah. um, special education divisions are almost solely made up of of black yeah. male students. So black male students are from elementary yeah. on being targeted. Mm -hmm. And placed Ur into urban, and placed yeah. into special yeah. education you, 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 programs. You, you you raise a point that mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make sure I hit, mm -hmm. which the, the title of the show is called the, Beyond, uh, the uh, Beyond the Color Line. Beyond the Color Line. Have we gotten beyond it? If we look at the data, yeah. whether it's housing discrimination, yeah. whether it's the resegregation of public schools that you talk about, mm -hmm. whether it's the fact that poor black children are likely to attend mm -hmm. schools full of other poor black mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. that, that segregation is a persistent problem mm -hmm. and has never gone away. Um, and uh, this title sort of begs the question. Well, and it falsifies. For, for those folks mm -hmm. that he interviewed, yeah, in falsifies. fact, it race is probably not much of an issue for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they the, upper middle the, class. the middle class. Well, the upper the middle class. The upper class. Yeah. Yeah. The upper class. middle class. Well, uh, well, I think money gives you, uh, you know, choices, uh, exactly. uh, gives you options, and that they opted out of the integration model uh, because it's, uh, uh, as, the, as they said something about, uh, we want to be with people who look like us, yeah. and it's a, a nice, we want our children to be around you know, people that look like them. Yeah. And, it, and it's much easier. Well, their money gave, gives them that option. And then, too, there has been a lot of change in the white community. And I hear uh, many middle mm -hmm. class people saying, is this what I want to integrate into? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the mm -hmm. dramatic change in how white society is functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because remember uh, the mandate at the beginning at Prakiet abolition was we were supposed to uplift the race mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we we're supposed to emulate white people, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the quality white people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's who we want. So the aristocratic model, mm -hmm. the white model that the middle class aspired to seemed to have kind of, a lot of it has collapsed uh, or appears to from looking at television. The popular mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. what's on right now, is, uh, is not a making... a specific example, Tansy. You haven't seen all that trash TV? <laughs> That's what you mean. You mean... Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the media. I mean, mm -hmm. even I, 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 all the different programs, I see a general dummying yeah. down of, of, of the media when it comes to the popular culture yeah. and the MTV culture that, uh, that you know, that our kids are taking, mm -hmm. you know, you know your clothes come from MTV, you know, you wear two yeah. dimes and a nickel. And um, uh, the language and, and, and the uh, lack of civility, uh, that type of thing. And I see the upper middle class who still aspire to that almost patrician aristocratic mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. uh, they aren't going for it. Mm -hmm. And so that makes them, they are taking the option, they're opting out. Uh, uh, and, that's an and interesting idea. So that's how, how, how I, I see, uh, as you well know, many of them are still maintaining these aristocrats, mm -hmm. you know, whatnot. They have uh, adopted to the current mm -hmm. uh, media model. So uh, I think that that's, that's part uh, of it for those people. Hmm. Any, uh, any rate, uh, did you um, uh, want to visit any of these... Um, 
I sent you, you know, like a copy of these, the questions, um, discussion questions that they pose on, on the PBS webpage. Um, uh, I think we t topped the one. It says, after, I'll read them down real fast and then see if you want to even bother with any of them. Uh, the questions that they address are, after noting that wealthy blacks in the South are opting to live with people of their own class who, quote, look like them, uh, unquote, Gates asked, what would Dr. King think of this? What do you think Martin Luther King would think of this? I would like to address that. Okay. Um, I wrote a book about a middle class suburb called Running Heights in Yonkers, New York. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a, a suburb that came into existence around 1914. And it's one of the first black suburbs in Westchester County. In, mm -hmm. um, and it's an all black or predominantly black enclave. And if you look at the history of that community, it was segregated by race and by class. Mm -hmm. But what makes it unique was that the residents of this community built their homes in an area that was surrounded by predominantly white homeowners. Mm -hmm. And they never experienced the traditional ghettoization process that historically the black middle class has experienced. Mm -hmm. That means they can only move to the border areas of the ghetto mm -hmm. where whites live mm -hmm. and more blacks come mm -hmm. in from migration and mm -hmm. the ghetto encapsulates their homeowning status. Mm -hmm. um, so you would have had more black enclaves, suburban, middle class mm -hmm. homeowners, had they had the opportunity to purchase homes like the residents in my community did. Mm -hmm. So this new phenomenon of class suburbanization and class segregation is not new. Mm -hmm. What is new is the opening up of housing for those black folks with money. That is what is new. And the scale. And the, the scale the at which that's taking place. Buy, exactly. You know, six hundred thousand dollar homes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the scale both in terms of the numbers mm -hmm. and in terms of the money. Mm -hmm. yes. That has changed. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the process, the social structural processes are very similar to how this black enclave and other uh, my community is not the only middle class enclave. There are other places, Greenberg and mm -hmm. White Plains, mm -hmm. St. Albans and in, in, uh, New York City. There are other places that are predominantly middle class and black. And you can look in the census data, there they are. Well, I was but, troubled by... Mm -hmm. Prince George County. Mm -hmm. By Gates' line of questioning to the um, mm -hmm. family from Michigan who've moved back to the South. Mm -hmm. um, and he seemed really suspicious of um, their decision to the live motives. in an all-black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and to, I'd like to kind of posit that against um, another interview he did with an upper-class black family, and that's a family who mm -hmm. integrated an all-white neighborhood in New mm -hmm. Jersey. And he was celebratory of what they did mm -hmm. because they integrated this all-white exclusive neighborhood, and yet he was suspicious of blacks kind of returning to upper-class neighborhoods in the South. Um, and in some ways actually kind of implied that mm -hmm. they were going against King's dream. I mean, he right. actually there answers the question. Yes, yes. He actually answers the, he, he, he right. poses the question at the end, mm -hmm. but he answers it through his suspicion right. that in mm -hmm. fact that what we should be moving towards is integration. And it shouldn't even be um, beyond the color lines. It should be mm -hmm. there is no color line, the title, because mm -hmm. he, he, is move, he wants to believe that we can move to a moment or a place where color doesn't matter. And I don't mm -hmm. know if that is, the I'm not, that's dream. not that's my agenda. I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. interested in that movement. I don't yeah. know how that would benefit us. And it's not also not possible, you know. Well, also well, federal well. housing studies mm -hmm. still show rampant racial discrimination mm -hmm. in the housing market mm -hmm. that middle class blacks are participating mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So all of the movement mm -hmm. to live in a black mm -hmm. enclave is taking place in, in a context of, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, uh, where, where they're being unwanted in mm -hmm. predominantly white areas. Mm -hmm. Yes. So is it, is it black retreat or black rejection or white rejection of blacks? I mean, so. Well, well, well the, the, the other thing I is. I think it's I, an I option they, you know, their money gives them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now they can exercise an option mm -hmm. in yeah, the so past. There's they, a difference between, as remember the bugaboo forced integration? Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a difference and, uh, and between forced in, uh, integration or forced segregation. But in, when you have separate, yeah, I think they call this separation of, of people mm 
mm. uh, you know, choosing to live elsewhere. And just like the, the lady in that, uh, uh, art, you know, that article, that segment said, she says, we, uh, we do not uh, shut out white people. They choose not to live here with us black people. But yeah, we, yeah, well, this is what I'd like to come. I mean, I think, you know, I grew up uh, in a community that was black, and we had a beach community that was black. Mm -hmm. But there were white people in it. There were white people who were part, who wanted to be part of the black community. So I, I mean, I, I think the idea that these communities are, are segregated is a little misleading because I think that the black communities are open to non-black people who want to be part of a cultural and political and mm -hmm. social life of that That's what the woman community. Was Whites so, move so away that, from uh, black communities if they become too black. That's correct. Well, the majority, yeah. And so I don't, you know, I mean, you can spend some time, uh, spending some time in a black sp space is not a bad thing. I mean, we used to have a black gospel choir, mm -hmm. which had a lot of non-black people in it. Okay, that's fine. You know, I mean, you have a symphony orchestra, okay, which is sort of a white, more or less white space, and you have non-white people in it. You have a black gospel choir, you have non-black people in it, that's fine. Well, but what, what the missing Cultural from the notion that we have reached the color, colorblind stage oh, where no. blacks who have money can simply just choose to either be in a segregated environment or an integrated environment yeah. misses the critical point that widespread in the housing market is racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it characterizes those choices that people make. Mm -hmm. So whether they admit it or not, I guess I would, the, the jury is out for me until we have a colorblind structural environment, mm -hmm. whether or not blacks will actually choose to live in all black mm -hmm. environments. That, that reality has never been in America. Right. Well, Do you well, expect exactly. it to be? I don't know. Well, 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 let me tell we you. have to wait to get there. <laughs> let, 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 me tell, let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister went to Wellesley, and um, one of her uh, white roommates once uh, former white roommate, um, my sister's kids went to the University, I think of North Carolina, and Calvin, the black football star, Calvin, what? Um, I'm sorry, there was Calvin a famous ba uh, black basketball player there, and this white woman asked my sister if her daughter could get introduced to this black football player. I mean, seeing a sort of a white patrician that her daughter having a match with this black football player, a uh, black basketball player, would be a good match. And I mean, so I think some things are changing for some people. Um, oh, sure. But, uh, you know, not necessarily for. And that's why everyone. I say, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? Because mm -hmm. Gates sort of showed us the positive side. Calvin Hill and the son was Grant Hill. Uh, I wanted them to get yeah. her to get yeah. daughter get introduced to Grant Hill. Yeah, well, I um, think that uh, uh, we're still talking about. I think people ha have an option or choices, yeah. and I, I don't think there should be a straight, uh, you know, like a right. either integrate or, or separate or or who you have to associate with. Uh, it doesn't it make it easier to know that what you're doing is your choice rather than that you're being forced and it's when structural racism yeah. gets in the way that we're complaining about. Yeah, but you know, I would like to, there was a point made in the video that's related to what you said, which is Chris Tucker talked about, you know, if you're a black star, you're a star. And if he comes he into a restaurant, if, if I come into a restaurant, he says, Give they say to me, you want this seat over here? You know, want the best seat? White man, get out of that seat. Let Mr. Tucker. That's only to a degree, though. No, but what I'm pointing mm -hmm. out is that there is this different place mm -hmm. where these yeah. stars are, and there's this different place maybe where some of these elites are, where, you know, the, the color line may be going away more, more than it does for uh, other people. Well, well, you know, well money offers access. Yeah, yeah. Money you know is I mean? access, <laughs> but look, look at O.J. I mean, as soon as you get in trouble, you, you, you're coal black. Uh, or Michael uh, Jackson. Yeah, the, uh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even mm -hmm. if uh, poor uh, Tiger Woods, you know, let him stab someone, and all of a sudden <laughs> he'll, he'll be black as you can be. Remember this: the mayor of New York City, when he was no longer mayor, could not hail a cab on the street. There was an article in the New York Times about that. So, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh -huh. like Malcolm X. Because he said was just another black face, and he's yeah. not a very distinct looking black face. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Mm. But I, I would like to talk about something um, that Gates poses at the end of the mm -hmm. Hollywood section. And mm -hmm. it, um, Carl, you um, paraphrased it well in terms of he's asking, will Hollywood move to a moment when race well, doesn't matter, well, right? Race doesn't matter, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it seems that all four, se all four sections of the series is asking that question in some yes. type of way. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I, I'm ambivalent about that, and I want to know what you all think. Can we move to a place where race doesn't is, matter? Is that, is that our goal? Is that what we're attempting to do? Because... I don't think we can ever move to a place mm -hmm. where race doesn't matter. I think we have to move to a place where race doesn't handicap, mm -hmm. um, which, is, uh -huh. which is different than a place Very that race so. doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Um, people are going to hold on to their sense of history and mm -hmm. culture and identity, but those things to me are completely separate from the issue of discrimination, access, equal opportunity. Well, yeah, I mean, but it seems like Gates is encouraging an integration into. I mean, I thought his mm -hmm. um, going on a field trip with Dr. Lenore Fulani and her students mm -hmm. was kind of a perfect moment of what he hopes this documentary will accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it's that blacks will, you well, know, tell, tell them more about what Fulani is I doing. Agree. I mean, I think it, well, wait, it just wait, goes back to the, the well, it goes doing. back to the other point that you made. Yeah that you know the gentleman from new jersey he held up huh? with great esteem and the couple who relocates atlanta to the black community he didn't look so favorably upon but but uh, we got to talk do you want to talk about the felani's program a little bit I for the public yeah um well felani which is interesting because i mean felani has a long history in new york city of being in sort of left politics mm -hmm. uh, and she's been around for maybe 30 years now yes. um mm -hmm. And so, but I'm not sure the public who would see her would see her. So she was sort of just presented as uh, uh, an mm -hmm. activist educator. Mm -hmm. So that was a little out of context for me mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, but she had a program uh, that is kind of a cultural immersion kind of program, mm -hmm. it seemed to me, that uh, was teaching uh, urban poor students, black students, how to um, act in social situations outside of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with elite whites, Wall Street. And yeah. she yeah. emphasized that concept of performance, right? She yeah. said she yeah. had yes. to teach right. her students a, a mm -hmm. set of performance skills. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And it's how to manage, how to um, operate in capitalist structures, primarily. Well, what, what was interesting, see, that, that it's mm -hmm. an idea that's very popular right now. I think it's in anthropology. There's a mm -hmm. scholar named uh, John Jackson, John L. Jackson, mm -hmm. who wrote a book yeah. um, Harlem called Harlem World, uh -huh. where he talks about race as performance. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that, I said, oh, okay, because he, you know, Gates mm -hmm. is at Harvard, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. was, a, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, that just seemed to me a sort of academic buzzword to mm -hmm. throw in there. Yeah, performance. Mm -hmm. It's all about performance. Yeah. It's always been about performance, how you act, how you speak. Yes. Um, it's, it's always been about performance. Mm -hmm. Race yeah. and class are always about performance. And gender. Uh -huh. And gender, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, um, I, I see it as like being bicultural or multicultural, You're altering your behavior as you change um, as your environment. You know, being able to function in various environments is what I, how I see it, because that's what happened to me. Uh, 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 being, like I said, come from a, my mother couldn't read. And, and I was, uh, you know, on re we were fa family on relief. Uh, I'm old. I was born in 31. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's like the tail end of the depression and all mm -hmm. that, and desperately poor. And, uh, but we lived on a black street in a white uh, people's part of town, white folks' mm -hmm. part of town. Mm -hmm. And so I went to a white school. And uh, whatever was going on there wasn't what I knew in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to learn to function. This is how I behave in my neighborhood, and this is how I behave in the school. And that's how I, I do it. First, I tried to incorporate it, but it didn't work. I used to tell what was going on in school. And, and my mother and all her friends, uh, uh, they'd laugh at me. Oh, what are they doing in that stupid school? Mm -hmm. So I quit telling her what was going mm -hmm. on in school, what I was learning, because it sounds silly to mm -hmm. many of them. If it wasn't just 
mm -hmm. you know, A, B, C or something. But I said, oh, H2O, the teacher said H2O is water. And it was, they laughed for hours. At any rate, um, mm -hmm. uh, so that forced me to function and, uh, and to look at it. This is how I do here, this is how I do here. And that's how I got along. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what you're talking about. Uh, we, uh, any, uh, uh, as we wrap up this uh, discussion, are there any um, closing remarks or something that you feel you must say as we... Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the segment on Hollywood I thought was very good. And one of the, uh, a white producer uh, was on there talking about how if you put a black face on a movie or many black faces in a movie that, you know, the capability of the movie to make money goes down unless it's sort of an, I guess, an, an A-list star and, and arguing that, that there's a certain discrimination, but it's sort of based upon what will sell. Uh, and so, you know, you sort of needed to have a white buddy in the movie or a white love interest. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have a love story with two black people, but if you got Halle Berry and Russell Crowe, well, that would be <laughs> wonderful. Um, and, and I mean, I thought this was interesting because I remember when I was in college and someone told me that the, the place I went to eat wouldn't hire a black female as a waitress because they were afraid that the customers wouldn't come. And because, you know, when a person who was dealing with malls came to talk here, they say they don't put malls in black areas because whites won't come. And it sort of seems an expansion of this same issue. You can, you can have this thing which is supposedly non-discriminatory, but if it's based upon a sense that there's a white antipathy to, you know, black employees, then it ends up being very, very discriminatory. Yeah, well, that's and how affirmative action worked because then that gave them a little leverage. Well, I, you know, yeah. you can explain to the white person, <laughs> uh, I really wouldn't have this black person yet, but the law says I have to. And, and, that, uh, that's and, and it, that worked at times that way. And, um, and, and, and I felt, well, go ahead. Well, I felt Why like the Black Hollywood section just played into the star system. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much that happens in media that yes. is outside of Hollywood, and there are so many independent black producers who are doing yeah. quite well, who are self-sufficient mm -hmm. and doing very mm -hmm. interesting work, like mm -hmm. kind of Marlon Riggs type work, yeah. you know, so mm -hmm. that doesn't fit it within his kind of structure of what yeah. counts as a media representation. And in fact, um, he interviewed one young director about his struggle <coughs> getting right. funding for a film, and the film, the Black Hollywood section ended with the credit that this director received money for Biker's Boys. Yes. Well, I got online to look up Biker's Boys, and, and in fact, Biker Boys didn't make enough money to actually meet its costs. Hmm. Yeah. So then what does that say, you know? So it was actually a flop. Yeah, it was a flop, standard. you know, after... Well, well, and, and well, the question is, yeah, correct. Yeah, and, but it was framed as if he was doing this kind of for the race, um, you know, the film, yeah. and for the race. I mean, it was a pretty... Can, kind of, yeah. you know, canned a action adventure film that the fact that Lor uh, Lawrence Tate and Lawrence Fishburne in it mm -hmm. didn't yeah. add much to the film, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that there's all these things that are happening outside of Hollywood that Gates, like, well, Gates not interested in because I think he has his own fascination with power mm -hmm. and money and that kind of Throughout all, well, all well, four well. Uh, sections, you kind of see that obsession he has with power and money and talking to people who yeah. have both. You know? yeah. I, I would like to talk about something that, that kind of angered me. I mean, I thought that, and it shows another reason why this is so problematic. I thought that In America was a pretty good film, but I thought that it was hyped way over its quality. Huh. You know, I mean, it was another story it. about you know, immigrant whites coming to America, making good with the help of a black person. And the, the African guy gives a good performance, I thought, uh, in the film. But then there was a film, Dirty Pretty Things, which I thought was a much better film. And it was about a different context. It was about black and Turkish immigrants being in, um, you know, in England. And, and the struggles the Turkish woman was having with sexual exploitation 
and the black man who had, was a pathologist but had to leave his country because of political things, how he was negotiating using his medical skill to help his fellow people, you know, um, even though he didn't have a license, uh, and other complications. I thought it was a really great performance, <coughs> but they didn't nominate him. And Hollywood is all, always nominating these black people who are helping white people. As we are yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> running out of uh, sorry, time, I, time. Um, I would like to know what grade you give this documentary. Do you think it was worthwhile? Will the discussion, uh, do you have any sense that this will begin a discussion uh, 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 about uh, America beyond the color line? Or do you think well, this the, ends? Well, the good thing about Henry Louis Gates, regardless of what he does, is he's so big, uh, mm -hmm. people will talk about it. Uh, and that's usually always mm -hmm. positive for the black community. Um, I, I want to just uh, sort of mm -hmm. sort of make one time. small point okay. about um, in, I, what I thought was a sort of con conservative conclusions that Skip Gates constantly kind of kept bringing us back uh, to. As we close this out. Uh, and Jesse Jackson ended it very, very well by saying, if we have sick villages, we have sick children. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in understanding the context of why folks don't make it, uh, it's very important. Okay. B yes, plus. I, I, what yes, do you say? I think you say B plus. What do you say, Nicole? Um, I think it's definitely worth seeing, but I think it's, you know, we've already seen these images before. I don't think it offers anything new to the discussion mm. on kind of where blacks are well, in contemporary Well, then the discussion US. goes on, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Hopefully it will. Yeah, this is what I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll give it a solid B. <laughs> a solid one? <laughs> a solid B. <laughs> All right. Well, there you have the grade for um, the documentary on the America Beyond the Color Line with Henry Louis Gates. And I want to thank the wonderful crew at Davis Community Television. Really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to be back with some further uh, information for the discussion on this topic. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> wow. It's a little warm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is warm. Oh. Wait, and you need to wire to which train? Oh, yeah, if, if we leave, if you and I leave at 8, 8, um, 840, how far is the train station? Is it about five minutes? It's 10 minutes. Okay, so if we leave around 830, Oh, yeah, we're good. We have a half hour. What is it, it's 8 o'clock right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would, I would use, I would use the show uh, we'll parts of it in my class. I'm really thinking of doing it. I thought some of the interviews yeah. were really interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. That's, I mean. Thank you. Yeah, I thought, no, it was good. Exactly. I mean, you know, that's what's good about it. It's always so, uh, so uh, no, I never used to be It was so canned, though. It was so canned. Like, there, he. But the interviews were good. Some of the interviews were good. Right, right, but, like you said, he takes the interviews and he wraps them back up into conservative issues. You know, he does these things with the interviews. And, like, there was.